Hello and welcome to our next lesson from our Cool Britannia history topic. This week we're going to be learning about one of the most significant events that happened at the end of the Second World War, which changed modern Britain forever. We will be learning all about how immigration changed the population of Britain after the end of the Second World War and still continues to do so today as a result. Before we begin, there's some key historical vocabulary which we're going to recap to make sure that we fully understand today's learning. The flag that I'm showing you now is the flag for the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth are a group of nations that are linked together. The King or Queen of England is recognised as the monarch in these countries. And nearly all of those countries were in the British Empire and colonised by the British in the past. A colony is a country or an area that is under control by another country and has been occupied by settlers from that country. An empire is a group of countries that are ruled over by one king or queen or monarch. Immigration is the movement of people from one country to settle in another and a country's population are the people that live in that country. Now the map that I'm showing you now is what the British Empire looked like in 1948. All of the countries that are marked here in red were part of the British Commonwealth. That meant that the people who lived in those countries were British citizens and had the right to live and work in Britain if they wanted to. You'll notice that they are spread far and wide across the globe. We're particularly looking at the group of islands of the West Indies today. This is places such as the Bahamas, Barbados, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago. During the Second World War, Britain had desperately needed workers and soldiers to fight and called upon the Commonwealth countries to help. This call was answered by many people who travelled from faraway places, such as the West Indies, to help, to join the RAF, to join the army, to work in factories. We're going to have a look at how some of those people were trained and moved to Britain during that time. Just notice here from the footage all of the different sorts of roles that people from Commonwealth countries were undertaking for the war effort at this time. Lawyers, reporters from the West Indies. They're being taught side by side with English men and women to operate all the latest types of machinery. In 16 weeks, they must know how to read blueprints, micrometers, slide rules, to set up and operate lathes, capstans, drills, and grinders. When their training is complete, they will go to aircraft or ordnance factories or machine shops. There are also others from several West Indian islands who volunteered and were chosen for their skill, and on arrival were immediately introduced into production in the united effort to beat Hitler and his gang. War is in the air, all West Indians will do their share. That is why they came, and not seeking glory or fame, they will fight. Next, let's hear a first-hand account of how Sam King from Jamaica joined the Royal Air Force and fought during the war, how he felt about leaving his home to join the fight. England said they needed men, and I took the test for the Royal Air Force and passed. My mother said, son, the mother country is at war, go, and if you live, it will be a v good thing. Well, I repair aircraft, I'm an a aircraft engineer, and I don't like Lancaster bombers because they are too big. Spitfire is all right, but what I like is the American Dakotas. 15,000 of us volunteered, and the air crews which were among the first, they, they wanted me to be a rear gunner, and my mother said no, because the average lifespan of a ray gun was six months. I'm glad I helped, yes. I could have gone to America and get more money, but no, because I did my bit for king and country. When the war ended, Britain was again in need of help to rebuild the country. We needed people to work in the factories, people to build new homes, nurses to staff the new NHS, and the British government again called upon the Commonwealth to help. In 1948, they advertised passage by a ship called the Empire Windrush for people who were willing to leave the West Indies and come to Britain to work and make Britain their Arrivals home. Arrivals at Tilbury. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-service men who know England. They serve this country well. In Jamaica, they couldn't find work. 
Discouraged but full of hope, they sail for Britain, citizens of the British Empire coming to the mother country with good intent. Prodded by public opinion, the colonial office gives them a more cordial reception than was at first envisaged. Many are to be found jobs. Our reporter asks them what they want to do. Now, why have you come to England? To seek a job. And what sort of job do you want? Any type, so long as I get a good pay. Some will go into industry, others intend to rejoin the services. Now, you're an ex-Air Force, aren't you? Yes. Are you going back into the Air Force again? Yes. Do you know if you'll be accepted? I think so. Some plan to return to Jamaica when conditions improve. I'd like to ask you, please, are you a single man? I am a single man. My, only my mother that is depending on me. And I'm also an ex-service man. You're ex-service? RAF, yeah, are you? RAF. I took a course in Scotland in case making. And uh, I'm desirous of going back there to see if I can further because I like it very much. And uh, I'm trying to help myself and also help my mom. Their spokesman sings his thanks to Britain. Now, may I ask you your name? Lord Kitchener. Lord Kitchener. Now, I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers. Is that right? Yes, that's well, now, will you true. sing for us? Right now. Yes. London is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You can go to France or America, India, Asia or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Well, believe now let's hear a first-hand account from Sam King, who travelled upon the Empire to return to Britain, about what life was like on the ship and the problems that they faced when they arrived. We had no intention of coming back to a colony. We were looking forward, we were looking towards a new home. It was in the daily Jamaican newspaper that this troop ship would call to Jamaica in about two weeks' time, and the passage was 28 pounds 10 shillings. Let's get that straight. The average man didn't have 28 pounds 10 shillings. It was equivalent to about three cows. And in the evenings, they have boxing competition and things like that, and dance and all things. But the main thing is, it was to mentally get yourself ready to land. I would go in the lower deck and I would have eight, ten of them. I said, look, food is ration in England. You can't grasp that. There's only any way to live because the body Germans destroyed Britain. So to get accommodation, but work is all over the place. So work is not the problem. It's somewhere to live and food to eat. Once more of our people start coming, and um, food still Russian, the unions blame the blacks for everything. Rubbish. And in the end, you have signs, keep Britain white, blacks go home and all that. The photographs that we're looking at now are what Jamaica was like in 1930. Just try to imagine how different it was for those people arriving from the West Indies at that time when they arrived in London. Um, arriving in Britain and seeing rows of terraced houses with smoke coming out of the chimneys and thinking they were factories because the only places in, in the Caribbean where smoke came out of the chimney was a factory. Uh, most of them had to buy a, a, an overcoat. <laughs> this is my dad behind me. That's my dad in the middle there. And uh, he didn't have an overcoat then, but that they would have, first thing they would have done is bought an overcoat because it would have been so bitterly cold for them. Arrivals at Tilbury. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Many are ex-service men who know England. I'd like to ask you, please, are you a single man? I am a single man. My, only my mother that is depending on me. And I'm also an ex-service man. You're ex-service, RAF, yeah, are you? RAF. I took a course in Scotland in case making. And uh, I'm desirous of going back there to see if I can further because I like it very much. And uh, I'm trying to help myself and also help my mom. Even though they were asked to come, 
uh, local people that d didn't want them there. There were signs in windows saying, no blacks, don't, don't, don't come here, don't, we don't want you here. And so they had to put up a, a lot with a lot of uh, discrimination. He started a group in the late 40s. They released a single that was never really a hit, but it was played on the radio, for and it's still played today. For generations it's played. Um, and it's called I Am A Mole and I Live In A Hole. And I know a lot of people of a certain age will remember that song. And my dad was the bass voice who sang, I am a mole and I live in a hole. I've had a lot of drinks bought from me because of that. Despite the fact that the British government had invited, asked and even advertised for people to come from Commonwealth countries to settle in Britain and make it their home, these people experienced racism and discrimination upon their arrival. This was the first time so many Caribbean people had come to live in Britain. Many more arrived in the following years. It was on the 22nd of June 1948 that the Empire Windrush arrived at Tilbury Docks in Essex. But when its passengers got off, they found that Britain was not as friendly to them as they had hoped. It was cold and grey. And the Caribbean people soon experienced racism and discrimination. They found it hard to get proper homes to live in and to make friends with British people. Later, Many of their children were bullied at school because of the colour of their skin. There were racial attacks, and years later, race riots broke out in cities across Britain. Settling into a new country was difficult. Despite these difficulties, Britain is indebted to the immigrants who came to Britain at this time. It simply wouldn't have been possible to rebuild Britain and the workforce and staff the NHS if people from the Commonwealth countries had not come to Britain to settle and make it their home. These workers were vital to Britain's post-war recovery. Immigration from Commonwealth countries at this time changed Britain into the multicultural and multiracial society that we live in today, bringing new foods, new music, new language, new dance, new fashions and everything that goes with it that shapes our modern way of life today. Your task for this week is to design a set of postage stamps to commemorate the Windrush and the impact that it had upon British society. The Royal Post Office releases a set of special stamps every month commemorating or celebrating something significant about British life. You can see on your task sheet here that you'll find on the Google Drive that this month the set of stamps that they've released are all to commemorate the end of the Second World War, but actually in March their set commemorated all of the different James Bonds that we've had through the decades, so you get an idea of the sort of thing that we're looking for here. You're going to choose Four things, the things that you think have changed modern Britain for the better as a result of the Windrush and the immigration that happened at the end of the Second World War. And you're going to commemorate those images on the postage as stamps. As always, here. you don't have to use the task sheet. You could do your postage stamps on any piece of paper. The important part is that you choose the one that you think is the most important change. That will be your £2 stamp. The one that you think is the next most important will be your £1.50 and so on until you've chosen four images. We'd also like you to give your reasons for why you've chosen these different images. Now you can see from my example here that I apologise, I didn't have the time to draw them so I've just done a little bit of dragging and dropping from the computer to put my images in here. But I've chosen for my most expensive stamp to commemorate the NHS staff who came from Commonwealth countries. The NHS would not have been able to survive in 1948 if it hadn't been for this workforce coming. The next choice is England footballer from the past, John Barnes. His parents came from Jamaica to settle in Britain at the end of the Second World War. And he's a fantastic sportsman that we would not have had in Britain had it not been for that post-war immigration. My next choice is to do with music and dance styles that came from the West Indies at that time and I've chosen to use a photograph of the Notting Hill Carnival to commemorate that and then last but by no means least Caribbean food which is so yummy. Good luck with your history learning this week everybody. Please do keep sending any examples of what you've done to the Year 6 email. We love to celebrate it on the Yanda. weekly celebration assembly. I shall leave you with Lord Kitchener who arrived on the Yanda. Empire Windrush in 1948 to sing us out. See you next week.
India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Well, believe me, I am speaking broad-mindedly. I am glad to know my mother country. I've been traveling to countries years ago, but this the place I wanted to know. London, that's the place for me. To live in London, you are really comfortable. Because the English people are very much sociable. They take you here and they take you there and they make you feel like a millionaire. So London, that's the place for me. Shaftree Avenue. There you would laugh and talk and enjoy the bridge and admire the beautiful scenery of London. That's the best one. Yes, I cannot complain of the time I have spent. I mean, my life in London is really magnificent. I have every comfort and every sport, and my resident is at Hampton Court. 